G'day guys, welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. I am Shrek and I'm not joined by Turbo at the moment but I am here to tell you about this episode with Andre Redakura. Now this episode is an absolute cracker. He's a top man and I really enjoyed this interview. Uh, it was just, it's just full on cool. We do a really um, deep dive into um, hunting dog tooth tuna, like the setup you need and he walks us through a really cool story about um, the trouble you can get yourself into in terms of like tangles and floats going everywhere when you do shoot a big doggy. Uh, a lot of fun. We also talk about filmmaking. He's the man behind, or one of the guys in, uh, behind um, Terra Australis, and these guys make phenomenal um, spearfishing films. Uh, so there's some really good tips and info in there about that. But um, I tell you what, Andre's just got, he's just got skills for days. This guy can chat spearfishing, uh, and you can hear, hear the passion in, in his, uh, you know, in his voice and what he says about the ocean. So it's it's, it's a it's a wicked interview. Uh, before we get there, uh, look, check out at Spear Junkies on Instagram. Uh, these guys have got a cool crew going. It's Chris Coates, MJK, Chris Dillon, and Brett Harvey. These guys are going to film a 12-part um, video TV series uh, where they target 12 species in all different parts of the world. Um, it, it's pretty magic. I've got the schedule in front of me, and we're going to be covering it a fair bit on the New Spiro podcast. But jump on and follow their journey at Spear Junkies on Instagram. Check check them out. So shout out to Chris and Chris and the boys. Uh, wish you all the best with the trip that's just about to start by the looks of it, or maybe it's already started. Um, all right, and then uh, next one, audible.com. Uh, 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing is available there as an audio book. Uh, if you go to audibletrial.com forward slash noob Spiro, you can get our audio book for free. And we got a cracker review on there. It says, keep up the great work, guys. I've learned so much in so little time from this book. Logan Pufal from the west side of Florida. So thanks, uh, thanks Logan. Awesome review, buddy. And uh, I'll link that up in the show notes. So if you head to Andre Redakura on Noob Spiro, you'll get uh, linked up to... Uh, audible free and you can get our book free and directly support the new Sphero podcast uh, what else is going on we are in the dying days of our kickstarter campaign so the thing has gone absolutely epically Ca uh, cannot say thank you enough to you guys for getting on and supporting us it's just phenomenal and uh, the books will probably the book will hopefully be available in a spearfishing store near you um, sometime in the second half of the year but for the guys that got on the Kickstarter campaign and got hold of some of the unique rewards like a free Spiro log um, awesome awesome thanks for your support and we offered up the Spiro log just to say thank you for getting on but uh, we're in the dying day so if you want to check that out go to kickstarter.com Pump and Spearfishing and our book project will come right up. You can hopefully get on it. All right, let's get into this interview with Andre Choice. Guys, the Adreno Easter sale is kicking along nicely. There's a couple of weeks left to go, so get online and check them out at spearfishing.com.au or visit them in store at Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne. I went down there myself and checked out wetsuits, huge range, some great savings to be had. Winter's coming. Go and check it out. Treat yourself. Double savings. Oh, yes. And whilst you're treating yourself, you can also use the Noob Spiro code at checkout and save an extra $20 on purchases over 200 How could I even forget that? Anyway, check it out. It's amazing. G'day, guys. Thanks for listening to today's Noob Spiro podcast. You're joining Turbo and I with Andre, a.k.a. What's his nickname, Turbo? Sea Monkey, I believe, and I'd love to know <laughs> what, what that's all about, Sea Monkey. I think it was from when um, I was um, sponsored by Rabbi Tech through Dan in Cross Harbour, and he's, he was starting this like cartoon like comics thing up, and I was just – because I'm, oh, I'm always hanging off trees and that, so <laughs> – I do act like a, I do act like a monkey. He say like everywhere I go, everyone thinks I'm a bit of a monkey. So he just started up the sea monkey. He even did did a sick comic. Eh? I wish it came out, but it was I was a hell cartoon character, and I was a <laughs> sea monkey. Yeah, and I was it was pretty cool. Oh, that, that is cool. awesome. That is cool. Travis Travis Corkin, um, one of your good buddies. He he told me to ask you about that as well. So I'm glad we got straight into that. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, uh, Andre. Um, look, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where are you living now? But you know, and what, and what do you do for a job? And and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm living on the west coast now. I've been over here for about eight years. I've just moved up to Exmouth, which is like one of the, probably the most beautiful places I've ever 
explored. It's um, it's just got the most amazing ocean and rich full of life. And um, at this time of the year is when it all starts to happen. You get all big congregations of uh, bait fish. You get schools of um, of the whale sharks, where all the that's where the most of the tourism comes from. From everyone going out swimming with whale sharks, you get. Uh, you start getting all the humpback whales migrating up north and they push along the coast here. You get killer whales coming through. It's just off the hook. It's full of sharks. It's amazing. I love it. That's crazy. And, and you work full-time in Terra Australis. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Terra Australis is a production company that myself and another two friends, Johnny and Ryan, have um, come up with and we've created over the last probably like five or six years. And Mostly came from a hobby, just doing a lot, a lot of filming, filming beautiful content in the ocean. It mostly revolves around sharks and shipwrecks. And we'll just sort of put together little documentaries or little movies and share it on social media. But uh, it's always caused a little bit of a hype. We've always got amazing content where the media's kind of jumped on it because a lot of it's around sharks too. So everyone's like, well, you guys are crazy. And um, <laughs> I think, yeah, you know, but. You know, we just sort of sh- sort of show it how it is and tell them that it's it's different than what you reckon and and um, yeah, share it with the world. Really cool. We're gonna we're gonna dig a bit more into this when we get to Veterans Vault, and uh, you can help us share some some t- tips and techniques, hopefully, to help everyone start making um, better spearfishing films and just sharing sort of the the wonder of it all, I guess. But um, look, take us back right, right to the beginning of your spearfishing. How did you get start started? Where did you grow up in Australia? Um, so I grew up in Port Macquarie, like a small little coastal town on the east coast in New South Wales. And it's all, yeah, it's a sick little beachy town, super quiet, um, little touristy joint. It's got amazing beaches and coastline, heaps of national park. And I used to just pretty much live in the ocean surfing anyway. And then I started snorkeling and uh, started spearfishing up the river, like chasing the feed for dinner, just some blackfish and some, um, some flathead and whatnot with some mates. And then... Yeah, just slowly started venturing out to sea, and um, yeah, it's just it's just all went started from there, really. Cool, cool. How old were you when you when you first sort of took a spear gun with you? <laughs> um, had a hand spear, eh? A little hand spear for the first time. That was probably when I was, I don't know, maybe fifteen or sixteen, eh? Fifteen. Was that a uh, was that one of the classic red fiberglass ones? Or was it the the old alley pole? I had a couple of sick ones. The first one was an alley one, a little light one, which yeah. wasn't that great. And then I think my brother had a fiberglass one. I got that. That was sick. And then and then I, I think my other brother had a telescopic one that I found Jeez. under the house, and that was even better. It was like heavier. Yep. Um. So I had had a bit of punch. Eh? Did you move moving the guns pretty quick after that? Like what sort of what sort of guns um, did you sort of get into, and how long did that take? I did. Eh? I I probably ended up getting a gun. Not that long after, right? Maybe, um, maybe like, oh, six months or something. I think I had like a little, little Sea Hornet thing, yep. like a meter gun. <laughs> yep. I think a tourism, yep. tourism or something. Oh, it was called. the tourist. It was, tourist. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it was sick. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I classic. loved it. Prank, eh? prank ahead, and um, the line release was just a little metal clip you had to keep bending to make it hold your line, and had a VB <laughs> cord, and yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty sick, but then. <laughs> I, I had to upgrade pretty quick. It was one day, like, finished school, and this massive storm came through, and it, it glassed off after the storm and went for a dive. And this is when I f- first ran into, like, um, bigger fish. Like, normally I was shooting brim and black, blackfish and that and didn't think much of it. And then I ended up running into this massive school of um, jewfish. And then they were all schoolies, probably up to 10, 12 kilos. Yeah. And I ended up getting – I had to prank ahead with that one-meter gun, and I, like – bounced off one and I was like this is nuts and then I ended up getting two and I was pretty stoked I I was like, me and my yeah. mate were just lose, losing losing our minds and then that's when I was like alright I'm, I'm going to need a big gun these things are crazy I started seeing them up to 30 kilos and wouldn't even attempt to pull the trigger out so I had to upgrade and that's when I removed the pole out of the gun and put a broomstick in it and um, got along the shafts and made a bigger rubber and then I started using this broomstick gun that was out of the same trigger and stuff yeah. and I like, even had so much it was so hard to pull the trigger sometimes because I had loaded it up so much power I was like yeah. had to really crank it but I, I landed like 30 plus kilo jewfish with that thing eh? well, that not... it just goes to show hey so and, and you didn't snap that broomstick no well I ended up giving it to a good mate of mine 
Quinn up in um, he lives up in Cairns now, yeah. but he ended up starting spearing and he's like, well, where's that broomstick gun? And I was like, yeah, take it, mate. And he, like, I think he's like a few weeks later, a month later, he's like, I should have been kingfish with it. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's so cool. I, I would love to know where it is, actually. The broomstick, eh? I was just going to say, it just goes to show that with all the carbon fiber and um, the technology, <laughs> hey, like it's when you boil it down, they're a pretty simple device, like the old spear gun. Can be, eh, yeah. for sure. And you had that classic, we're going to need a bigger gun moment when you saw the big Jewfish. That's pretty cool. I remember the first time I heard about you, it was from Travis, and uh, he was uh, out the front of a rocky headland, I believe, and uh, and this young uh, this, this young ragamuffin showed up and said, oh, you mind if I borrow your gear and go for a look? And uh, I think that was you. It was, yeah. I remember watching him, like, snooping around. There was, like, a, a sick Jew hole down there, and I was like, Oh, I wonder if they've had a look and they were getting out of the water. I was like, how'd you go? And they're like, oh, not much down here, eh? I'm like, oh, I know where they are. And then it was sick, perfect condition. I was with my ex-girlfriend. I had, like, jeans on and everything. I was like, reckon I can borrow your gun? And they're like, oh, what do you mate? And then I, I like, they took my shirt off, jumped in with my jeans and borrowed the gun and goggles and some fins. And I was like, within five or ten minutes, I just knew this whole way. And I came back with, like, maybe a 15-kilo Dewey. And they're just like, what the fuck? Who is this for a guy? <laughs> and then, like, I think that night, that same night, they were like, come over for Barbie. And we went over and cooked out this massive feed with the fish. And I don't remember doing it, but Trav was like, this guy's is like a caveman. Eh? And I was, he said I was, like, dipping my hands in the butter and just, like, rubbing it over the fish or something. And I was like, <laughs> Probably they can kick me out of the house. I say. Uh, uh, it's awesome. That's awesome. Look, it does. It, it sounds like you had a, a pretty relaxed um, start to spearfishing. Did you have any any struggles, like obstacles, getting started? I mean, you're like you're naturally in the water all the time. But what 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 did you find difficult? Oh, uh, it was probably like the weather and the conditions and the visibility. It was really dirty a lot in Port Macquarie, so we're always restricted to sometimes like two meter beers with like you know swelled breaking over your head and. Like you had to really watch it and stealth in and um, start learning all these spots, like finding the areas and learning the seasons. It's all learning the whole the makeup of um, how fish live and work, I suppose. And um, yeah, that was that was about it. Just learning, learning all the the seasons and learning how a fish works. Mm. We just we just created a, a spearfishing log so guys can kind of write down all the conditions that they encounter so they can kind of replicate you know su- success did you did you keep a log or anything like that how did you how did you keep track of all the spots did you just remember them all oh um, i haven't got a good memory but when it comes to like crayfish holes or like a jewfish hole or anything like that i can remember it like <laughs> back of my hand eh? it's cra- weird like a I could remember someone's name I met two minutes ago, but then I could I can remember that stuff that easy. I don't never had to really write it down. I could look up, see a headland, see see this or see that bit of rock, and I knew that if I went that way, like that's where that cave is. Or and then seasons were kind of like you just learn that over time as well. When it's a good time to hunt that fish or the other fish, you know your pelagics or your mull away or the conditions and just everything like that. <clears throat> sort of just log it into your into your own head, I suppose. You do it that much. Mm-hmm. So did you, did you, did you like do like triangulate like with a couple of things on the shore, like get a hill in the front and a tree and so you can kind of, you know, remember where you were or how, how did you do it? Some of them, some spots I did. Um, I had to do like transect lines with a tree and a house behind it or something like that. That was further offshore and like you okay. couldn't see the bottom sometimes. But most of it was just a headland and that rock, and you just kind of I can look up and see that that headland, and that's not far away, and I kind of know that I'm in line with it. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. That's a handy trick to learn. Um, so, did you have a mentor? I mean, how did you learn all the all your all your tricks? How did you how did you sort of get get through all the struggles? I probably like this with the lads that's that back at home. We all sort of learnt together and. Then when we started spearing, like with the bigger guns and chasing mull away, I think some of the boys had some old school spear fishing videos with like Rob Torelli and um, I think the Paxmans and um, like Greg Pickering and um, all of those lads were in there. And that's when you were like, whoa, these guys are like shooting Wahoo and um, <laughs> getting big Spanish mackerel and stuff and kind of 
looked at that and like, well, that's pretty pretty cool. Um, and then there was a few guys in town too that we kind of like got into it pretty quick together with um, like Simon Ladder and Todd DeGraff and Travis and I, and we kind of like all bounced off each other a lot too, eh? Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, cool. Next part of the show is a memorable fish story. I, th- I think you might have a few. You've been you've been in the water for a long time. Um, tell us some tales. I've had some sick times. I've travelled around the world. Trav and I used to travel a lot, um, depending on the seasons. It's sort of like you know, you go when you're growing up spearfishing. You yeah, you, know, you get you know you just get that. You get stuff with the small fish, get your bigger fish, and then you see these videos, and then you're like, oh, I want to chase that type of species and. So we started like going to Fiji and through Indonesia and stuff and, you know, Mexico and stuff like looking for this, these fish. But there was a few sick ones, like always, you know, like everyone wanted to shoot, shoot a dog tooth tuna and I spent a while eh, chasing a few of them. They're that powerful and that crazy. Like <laughs> they're, they're so, like, it was pretty hard to land, I think. I don't know. We, we had, we always had them like snap stuff or, you know, we had to go through our gear that with a fine tooth comb kind of thing. But, when the, one of the first one of the first dog is landed, yeah, it was ended up being like just over seventy five kilos, oh, yeah. and then that was yeah, that was probably most memorable. Where I took had a dive and ended up in a school of probably like um, fifty or something, and this one, this huge one, just came through, and it was just I was just sort of had to be patient and wait for it to come underneath me, and then yeah, put a really good shot in there, and then it took off with my gear and took all my floats under and caught up with someone else's floats. Took like maybe like four, five floats under, I think, and then oh, um, it was mayhem hey, for a while, and then I fought it for a bit and dragged me out into deeper water, which was good, and then it sort of like bellied up a bit and it started to float because its bladder was full of air, and then a the whole school of doggies followed it almost to the surface. Hey. It's pretty sick, it's pretty crazy to watch, and then, yeah, I got that I got that fish, sort of suppose it's like a trophy fish, I suppose, and, um, yeah, it was pretty pretty impressed and I was like in the area with the villages and that so I got to share with everyone like all these little kids are like on the beach and I was giving them like these biggest two kilo chunks of like meat <laughs> and they're running off like they're holding it hugging it out it was pretty cool <laughs> that is that is pretty cool so like um what some guy I, I, my priorities um Andre are always about food you'll get this from me a lot um, what is, what what does Dr. Tuna taste like? Uh, I've never shot one and I've never eaten one. Um, it's really nice sashimi. So it's probably, with sashimi-wise, it's similar to um, Spanish mackerel. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe not as soft, but it's pretty, really nice. I love it. Sashimi and ceviche is really good. Um, you can sear it as well. It's just like a, probably not as tender and soft as a yellowfin tuna, but I suppose it's like... Pretty similar to Spanish mackerel. Eh? It's it's a, yeah, it's yeah. not as uh, it's not as dark in color, is it? No, it's not. No, it's it's similar color to Spanish mackerel. Again, maybe not as white. Maybe in between. Eh? Yeah, I, mm. I, I was quite surprised when you cut the first one open to the color of the flesh, and you sort of expect that really dark um, tuna flesh, but it's it's not. It's sort of yeah, like you said, somewhere in between. It's actually yeah, very surprising. Yeah. Kind of like trans translucent, even a little low. Eh? Mm, yeah, strange. Mm. So to hunt that fish successfully, what did it weigh, by the way? Do you know? It's just a, um, just over seventy six kilos, and then to hunt it was just yeah, a lot. Was, again, we had I had to use um, landmarks, and it's in a drift, and you have to dive at the right spot and hit this area, and and you got to yeah, you breathe up and you're trying to get relaxed, and it's probably sitting at about twenty five meters when you. I think it was about just 27 meters when I shot it. Yeah. Um, wow. So you're kind of like drifting and there's heaps going on. Uh, it's not easy. And they, so, but, um, yeah. We using what, what did you use? Like breakaway rig on a, just a straight hard line and and what several floats? What was your what, what did your setup look like? It was a breakaway system. It was like I think eight mil shaft with the slip tip, like one of those um, Alexander slip tips. Or the Mori, it might have been a Mori. We use Mori a lot, and then. It was like stainless wire to um, to like this Dyneema. It might even have been one of those rife ones. So Dyneema to uh, like a hard float, maybe like 20 litre hard float to another hard float with like a bungee in the middle of that, I think. And then it was a while ago. And then maybe another short bungee to a um, atmosphere float. And oh. then 
it just it just ended up getting as it took off like the mates had the flasher there and got caught in the flasher so that went with it and then another mate's gun got caught on it and that, that all went with it too like. <laughs> <laughs> so i i got yeah. it all off as i was fighting that just flipping it over the floats and sort of cleared it all yeah and then um and then i was all right after that so yeah. so you you before i sort of picked up on you said like um the learning curve for the equipment for these big fish is kind of one of the toughest things. What what were some of the the things you have learned? Because um, it sounds it sounds fairly complicated. Like it's it can be yeah. Like we've had some slip tips, snap and stuff, and then so you want to make sure you get like it was a cast one. So you want to get machined um, slip tips. Um, they want to be a reasonable length so they can have a fair bit of, you know, metal on the other side of the fish so it can hold really well with a lot of surface area. You want your wire on that thing to be, you know, Mickey Mouse, so check for any rust or corrosion on your wire because they have a ball on the end and sometimes they can break if it, they're not new, they've been sitting around. Um, your crimps on everything, just your threaded tip, all threaded on strong. Um, then then you go to your stainless wire on the end of your shaft and just make sure you fin. you got a good shaft that's got a good, thin attachment because that can hurt them coming off and just just going through it all and then make double double crimp everything um just have everything really rated heavily and shackle things off um splice so, things off and some guys treat the setup like it's a little bit secret but i i almost think it's like you're doing a discredit um to the fish because if guys aren't using aren't using a a, a rock solid setup they're potentially shooting a fish that will get away and it'll die somewhere. And so it's kind of almost a waste. So I think like dialing your gear right in like makes sense from a hunting perspective, but also like a looking after the fishery kind of thing as well. Oh, I'm happy to, uh, for someone to know any of that. You know, like it's, it's not like we're going to tell them where to go and they still have to dive those conditions. It's never that easy, but to give away like tech, like, the technique or even just not even that but to give away the setup is like everyone should share that because yeah you don't want to just go out and wound fish and lose gear and just because you can't you just don't want to tell them how to how to set it up like that's yeah, kind of yeah. that's silly that's a bit silly i think yeah that's, that's the first time i've heard anyone say that uh the first time i've heard that you should be using it it was a, a machined uh a machined uh cast sorry a cast machined. No, no, not machined. There's, 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 cast, there's cast tips that must be made in the mold, and I've yep. seen them snap for us. And then there's just the normal machined ones that are made on lathes and, like, you know, handcrafted kind of jobbies, which are, which is, he's, he's better, you know. Yep. Okay. And they've got to be, you, you want a good length um, tip on there. Obviously, that goes through toggles, and that's all the holding power there, essentially, the length of the. Um, slip tip. So you use a, a long, a longer style, I guess. Of um, slip tip? The ones that the, the standard ones for the, the Maoris and the Alexanders are, are pretty long anyway. Like they don't. Yep. They must be like. Um, they must be at least a hundred mil or something like okay. that. Eh? But yep. um, I think you can get extra long ones. But the the standard ones that those boys do are, are, are pretty good already. Mm. Yeah. And and like I'm just going to ask you, like with shot placement, you're looking to go through the head, like. What's I mean? What's your what's your thoughts on on shot placement and how good are these slip tips at holding? Um, shot placement's pretty crucial for sure, especially on a big fish like that. Normally, not most, not much of the time that you're side on with them, you're kind of like on a forty five above them. They'll swim under you or to the side of you or something like that. It probably can get a lot of side on shots as well, but you yeah, pretty much through the top of the head, at the back of the head, kind of thing through the big thick part of the meat. Um, it's side on, you know, behind the pectoral fin and on a 45 out towards the head, like that's a six shot and then you can save your shaft a bit too if, it, if it's on a bit of a backward angle as it fights the fish, you're not going to bend the shafts. And, and then, yeah, if you get, if you do get it anywhere there and your, your slip tip opens on the other side of the gill plate or uh, of anywhere on the head, you're, you're, guaranteed, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to get it unless something else breaks. But if you do go gut shot and stuff or like a higher – Above the above the backbone shot mid body, it can still tear out. eh? like it could tear the fish in half. Is that right? They're, sure. they're, they're fairly soft, are they? Yeah, pretty much. But just just the power, they're just that powerful. Like um, they'll just yeah destroy your gear. They'll just destroy themselves. Hey, eh? they just yeah right. Wow. All right, cool. That's that's a mint. 
uh, memorable fish story that we've kind of extended out because I, like, it was really interesting to learn about the equipment. Guys, Sparing Magazine have joined the Noob Sparrow podcast to bring this episode to you today. Now, Sparing Magazine are, they're, they're actually, they're the best spearfishing magazine in the world. I'm saying it, Turbo said it, now you know it. And uh, if you head over to Sparing Magazine, you can check out the team. They've got Jeremy Gamble, John Paul Castro, Sky Bailey, Christopher Landers. You have a look. There's some f- fantastic people they've got on staff. And that's why they produce the world's best spearfishing magazine. The photography is just popping. The stories are awesome. Turbo's been rejected several times. And uh, that's how you know it's top quality. So head over to SparingMagazine.com. You, you can buy it at your local retailer in the US. Or you, can, you can even get the digital subscription online, SparingMagazine.com. We're up to hunting technique. So, um, yeah, what's what's sort of a species you like to hunt? And then, you know, what technique do you use to sort of effectively um, hunt, the, hunt them regularly or successfully, I should say? At the moment, so I've changed as I've Changed over time, I suppose. I've sort of slowed down on the spearing a lot and doing a lot of underwater filming, and um, things have changed with um, the spearing a lot, really. Like, I, I lived on a boat for a, a fair while there. I was out at sea for eight months and just sort of just end up changing a lot, just sort of shooting a fish whenever I need it, every three days, maybe. So now I'm kind of like I'm pretty selective with what I want to get and, and what I feel like eating, really. But and I like to sort of get a species that's pretty prolific or a fast grower or it's not a, a breeder or it's not too big so I kind of you know, really fussed it down a lot but I, yeah. I enjoy shooting Spanish mackerel because they're like they're amazing sashimi they're really good smoked and they're really good like seared and cooked as well um they go a long way get a lot of meat off the off the fish and they're, they're yeah they're pretty prolific at times so that's uh, and they, they can put up a pretty good fight too actually but um that's probably one there yeah, the Spanish mackerel and there's a few yeah. like and ha- ha- yeah, no, that, that's that's great. How how do you hunt them, and where do you where do you find them though? So they're a, they're a pelagic fish, so like your warm tropical waters. Um, they'll get down the coast in summer times with the currents on the east and west coasts. Um, you'll sort of like find them on like some like reef edges that are holding bait, um, where there's a bit of tide, a bit of current, like some drop offs areas. They sort of like to hunt and patrol fish. Along those sort of stretches. Um, okay. Hunting wise, like really good for with burlies and flashes are really good for Spanish mackerel and pretty much all pelagic fish. Mm. And then when you do see them come in, you kind of just, as you try and like either free dive to the bottom if it's shallow enough and just sit there. And they're pretty, it can be pretty inquisitive. They'll come right up to you, they'll just circle you. Yeah. Um, that's a good way to wait, wait for them to come to you. Or if there's sort of deeper water and you won't make it to the bottom really in time or whatever. You can sort of take a dive and just either swim parallel with it, uh, and they can sometimes come sh- just turn and just come right in front of you. I've done other times where I've followed them from behind, and they've like they'll sort of turn to the right to look at you, so you go to the left side of them and they're blind side, and they'll turn the other way, and you just do that sometimes a couple of times, and they'll 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 eventually turn sideways as well. Yeah, sometimes you can tap your gun with them a little bit if you're just sitting still, or yeah, sometimes I'll just dive mid water and just sit still and they'll yeah they'll come up it's just being slow and steady no fast movements and pretty much not yeah not swimming straight at them face on or something like that yeah do you do you find they behave if you're on the bottom do you find they behave a little differently to mid-water like in terms of coming into you yeah a little bit they'll still like similar but it's definitely a lot better sitting on the, on the sea floor motionless and still they'll They'll circle you sometimes. It sometimes can be too tricky, a bit tricky to shoot them. They get them that close and they're right above your head. So you've got to like sometimes shoot them from underneath. But um, that works <laughs> pretty well. Are, they're a great fish to, when you know they're around, you send your mate down to lay on the bottom and they won't come in on him. But when he comes back to the surface, in come the mackerel and then you just go down and slot one. Is that a technique you use as well? I try and do it to turbo whenever I can. I, ha- I have before, eh? And the mates, they get so dirty, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've I've actually landed a really big one for um end up going thirty seven kilo, and that oh. was I thought I actually thought it was a shark eh when it first came in because they're like so slender had had a hell fin on it just the angle I was on it's laid up I was like what is a shark sick and then end up being there this monster monster of Spanish mackerel eh? it's unreal yeah where was that fish mate was that in, was that in WA it was in WA yeah it was in a pretty sharky area too. It was that big, I think. The sharks were scared of it. It had 
I was I shot it and it took off, took my float under. I thought I was going to lose everything. wasn't really prepared for it. And then I chased it all. And then I was as I was swimming up through the float, these sharks were bolting the other way. I was like, what? It's, uh, it's unreal. So, yeah, that, that was, even the sharks are scared of it, eh? That's a big you know you shot a big mackerel when the sharks are afraid of it. <clears throat> All right. So let, let's do, let's dial in a little bit more on your mindset. Like at the start of the hunting technique, you sort of talked about how your your mindset's really shifted a lot, um, and now you 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 know you're very um, targeted. I mean, how to, to walk us through that process? It's something that sort of Turbo, Turbo and I have noticed with guys as they you know progress through the sport, things sort of change. I mean, tell us about your experience. Um, yeah, it's really nice, though, eh? because like you, you go to some of those amazing places, you know, in the world, to sometimes see these fish, and I don't know, you just sort of start seeing the beauty of them, and like, even just like, like look, watch, if you just sit there and watch the fish for a while, you sort of start, you know, you'd be pretty mesmerized by them, and the way they act, and there's heaps of times now where a fish will just be sitting in front of me, and I can't even pull the trigger, because they, they just look, look unreal, and they're the most amazing colors, and they shimmer, and the way they move and just start building more respect for just the ocean itself really and you know I don't have to I'll still survive I'm sure I've got salad in the fridge if I don't need to get it really get a fish but I'm not <laughs> going to die if I, if I was going to die sure I'll get him but if I don't really need to then I won't worry about it I'll just enjoy it as it is. I, I, I'd die if there was only salad in the fridge. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> you gotta, you got to spice it up a bit you got to get a few like chickpeas in there and that you know, <laughs> you know fruit it up with some sun-dried tomatoes and some olives and, uh, uh, yeah. you know make it fancy hey Andre, the um you're saying like now you've sort of got a bit more respect for the ocean like did you did you go through the you, you did you become a bit of a trophy hunter like when you started was it were you chasing that adrenaline buzz is that what is that what really like piqued your interest uh, i don't know what it was just the the adventure side of things, traveling the world to these remote areas is really appealing. And then, yeah, we love spearing and to to land like a, a big fish, like a, a big edible fish. It was really, yeah, it was a, it was a good goal, I suppose. Everyone's talked about dog tooth tuna, this and that. And, you know, it wasn't never going to go to waste, which is the main priority, I suppose. And it was a pretty crazy adrenaline for sure, um, just to get being in the water with those things. But... I'm more than happy now to just like yeah, watch and either see my mate pumped on getting one or just to just to watch them swim by. Now I'm not not too worried, eh? Yeah, right. Cool. Sounds like a cool place to be in, to be honest. Yeah, it's good. It's I'll, so good. I'll get there too once I shoot a 76 kilo um, doggy. I'll just I'll just hang out my fence, mate. That'll be it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I lived on a boat for a long time and I've been. Just, you know, living in a lot of remote areas around the world in Western Australia and just notice that I don't really need to, like, um, get those amounts of fish I used to or to just don't need to. I can be fine with one fish every three days or just even if I don't get it, it doesn't really matter. You're not shooting, like, cool. a 50-kilo doggy every three days, is it? It's not <laughs> like... <laughs> no, I feel like... A sick, like, um, you know, a three kilo trout or a two kilo trout or something like that, you know, and then last year for, last year for a while, eh? All right, cool. Next part of the show is toughest situation, Andre. So, um, you know, how, how old are you? How old are you? Um, 35. 35. So you've been in the water for, for, for 20 years, sparing, really. What's what's one of the toughest situations you've had and, and what did you kind of learn from it? Um, I had a couple, I suppose, but... Um, it's more like just um, scariest. It's sort of like I've had a, I've had the, I've rescued like um, four mates now from blackouts. So that was kind of, and I've, I've lost one and a good mate to it. There's been a few mates that have been taken down, but um, yeah, I suppose that can shake you up a bit and be pretty, pretty gnarly, pretty tough if that's if that's what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll walk us through, um, you know, one of these blackouts. Um, they were all really different too, which is kind of fun, kind of crazy. Like the first one, my mate was just complacent, chasing the fish really deep, shot it and just bolted the surface, blacked out on the surface, shaking. Um, and I had him already, so he was all right. Um, he just shaked for a little while and he came to, which was good. And then 
another mate. Uh, he shot a fish too, kind of deep, at, just on his boundary. And there's a shark there trying to eat the fish. So he just tried to skull drag it up and he hit the fish mid body, stoned it, but by parachute and sort mm. of struggled to get up. He fitted on the surface as well. And he's a pretty big guy. So it was hard to get his head out of the water because he was like curling over. And then another mate was just, I'd, He's in a cave and just trying to get this crayfish, and he blacked on the surface, which was they're all pretty, pretty like if you're there, like you're fine, and if it's on the surface, it's all good. Travis one was probably the worst, which was like um, the scariest for me because it was it seemed like it was different than all the others. And he was Travis a deep diver, right? he's like sick to watch. He's he sit in the bottom like in 35 meters, pretty easy, which is insane. And we we're using these like throw flashes i've seen the whole dive unfold and i was like oh i could just see it all happening and then use a throw fl- fl- flasher and it'll start twirling and sinking slowly and it'll get to like 15 t- meters and you'll you'll start your dive and you'll dive to it and put it in your b- weight belt and then you'll go to the bottom and okay. he, went, he went he went past it which is already like oh okay no worries it's all right and then i watched him on the bottom it was like that clear and in, in fiji and then I was watching him sitting there and I was like, oh, it's a deep dive. He's doing really well. And then I just seen him start looking for that flasher that he didn't grab. And it was right above his head, but you got your goggles on. If you're looking around in front of you kind of thing, you don't see it. It was like right above his head. So I seen a bit of time wasted there, like not long, maybe like, you know, five seconds, eight seconds, but that's still a little bit. And then he grabbed it, started swimming up. I said, all right, he's doing all right. No worries. We always watch each other pretty, pretty closely on that and these sort of stuff pretty much all the time really. And then, He's coming up, and it, the, our flash is set at about probably 15 meters. And then the Spanish mackerel came through, and I was like, "Don't even attempt to shoot at that." <laughs> and yeah, anyway, he pulls his gun up, and I was I was already like pretty much breathing up. Hey, and I sh- seen him take the shot, and I just seen him fumble with the gun. But and then I was like, I was already heading down. I just knew this is bad. And then he was out cold at about yeah like 12 meters. So I was probably at about eight meters at that stage anyway as he as he was like a crucifix say eh? like just frozen not even nothing and then grabbed him brought him up and um just ripped his mask off and like just yelling at him talking to him shaking him and, like wasn't any shake like wasn't any convulsing like the diaphragm wasn't even activating like all the other blackouts their body's trying to breathe like their their diaphragms shaking and convulsing and whatever and the body's trying to breathe, but this but Trab's body was already like at that depth, so it's locked up. It's everything's closed up. The diaphragm stopped. It's the yeah, epiglottis, so your throat, whatever, closes up. Like it's a, it's a safety guard, so you don't drown really. But yeah, he was like he was fully locked, and that was like he's scary for me because I wasn't sure like you know what to kind of do, I suppose. But I just ended up I was yelling at him, and then I started thumping him in the chest, and then I was like, I'm gonna start CPR, and then like it felt like a forever but it probably wasn't that long but then he, yeah, he he then he started shaking and then i was like all right sweet we're going through the processes of the body trying to breathe and then he took a big breath and then like looked at me and he's like i think he said so i'm sorry man like that was the first words he said and i was just like fuck man this is crazy that's bad eh? oh, so anyway i was just like yeah i was stoked to be there for him but that was yeah pretty scary eh? wow wow <laughs> <laughs> wow well, so you've seen that a few. Is freaking crazy. Oh, yeah. Seen a few. Eh? I've always like, I always keep close eyes on my mate. So even if we're diving, in, there's a few of us diving. I won't even dive. I'll just watch because no, no, you just never know, eh? And like the big, biggest difference between you having your back to them and still being next to them, or you ha- looking at them. Like if I had my back to any of them and I was still five meters from them, they would, I'll die. They'll sink and they're gone. Like it's just. If you're if you're looking at them and you just grab them with one arm, it's that easy to rescue. I end up doing the free diving course, and the biggest thing, best thing I learned out of it was a proper rescue, like putting your hand up behind the head, bring them to the surface the correct way, having their head out of the water the right way, taking their mask off their face, tapping them on the face, talking to them to breathe, to breathe, because that's one of the last things senses it goes out is your, your hearing. So you can normally sometimes still hear. And then you've got your senses on your face. You need the wind to blow on it. So it sort of tells the body that it is out of the water and it can, it's safe to breathe. Yeah. And then if that doesn't work after that, then, you, yeah, your steps are starting uh, mouth to mouth. And, yeah. So I'm glad okay. I've got a video on that too, eh? So I've, I've made a video to um, show you a rescue, a basic rescue. So I'll give you that link. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so all right, after the kind of the 
after it all happens, like what's the story, Andre? You guys just call it a day? Like you're you're done for the day? Pretty much. Well, that diver's done for the day, 100%. It's, yeah, you just want to keep a close eye on him. But if anything, I think you should just call it a complete day. Because if you get water on your lungs and you start getting flu-like symptoms, you can go down here really quick. And they can, they, can, they can still drown, apparently. Like my mate was coughing for a few hours afterwards, eh, and I was really worried about him. We're staying in this village in the middle of nowhere. And, um, yeah, like as soon as you get that water in your lungs, you can it must be like a pneumonia effect. You can... It can produce phlegm in there, have a reaction with the salt water, and can really mess you up. So, just like well, first, f- first of all, for me, well, well done for 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 being there for your mates. You you, you did a you did a magic job four times. So that's pretty cool, man. That's that's pretty cool. Um, did did you guys report any of that? Like you know, Dan um, Divers Alert Network have got a a free diving report. Um, notification like for did, did did you did you walk through that process? No, most Spiros aren't aware that there's a place to report stuff. And, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, I didn't know. Eh? And I think the information could really help everyone. Um, so I mean, that's why I bring it. But I mean, I only really just learned about it a while ago. I was, I was reading through the the annual diving reports that they publish, and I was reading about you know statistics about deaths and all the rest of it and not not real nice light light reading but i was trying to write an article and i was just i just noticed it myself it's something i wanted to start talking about a bit more but yeah it's good to acknowledge a eh? like and to learn and to like it's so silly i feel it's sat silly if someone dies from a blackout it's 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 so easy to avoid it's that easy to avoid it really like most of blackouts are always usually going to be close to the surface if not on the surface so any Almost Joe Blow can rescue them by grabbing them. Like you don't have to be a thirty meter diver or even a twenty meter diver to 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 help prevent a blackout because it's it's so what a blackout is when all the that's when it all starts to happen when you come into the surface. That's when it that's when it happens. So most of the time, yeah. Uh, so there's not really any excuses, eh? Yeah, that's right. Andre, um, you you spoke there. You said your mate was coughing um, for the days after. Uh, you've seen four of these now. You've been around four blokes. Um, are they right as rain the next day, like apart from that coughing, or is there headaches, chest pain, or is it just smooth sailing from then and you, you sort of get back into it? No, I reckon um, if they're not right as rain like straight away, like um, definitely call it, call it a day. Mm-hmm. Go and rest up and fully monitor your mate, definitely, especially if you're anywhere. Just make sure they're all right because – you can have if you get if he gets flu like symptoms, it can be really dangerous. That's when they can go really downhill. So yeah. um no, nah, I don't I just really keep it this doesn't doesn't finish from there, eh? So yeah. um keep an eye on if it's if if you get in flu really bad flu like symptoms, go straight to the hospital for sure. Alright, cool. Hey yeah, um good. you mentioned too about like um practicing a rescue when you do a free diving course. I, I kind of experienced the same thing. I was like I've done life saving and all this sort of stuff, like in the water. I spent a lot of time in the water, but actually doing a rescue drill was just like I couldn't believe how difficult it was and how badly I did it the first few times. Um, do do you do you drill it with your mates, like or, or like? I mean, you've been doing it for a long time now. Is it just kind of second nature? Or, I mean, what's the story? I don't even really push it too hard when I'm with, with mates. I don't know that well. I just sort of cruise, but yeah, we. We all kind of know when we were chasing the deep, doing the deeper dives and chasing the big fish. We all kind of knew it all, all pretty well back to front. We all trusted each other was with our lives, really. Eh? But it's good to. I think I should brush up on it again for sure with the mates I die with now, just to just to make sure you know. Like it's pretty basic. It is basic, but it's you still need to be shown the steps, and especially in a panicky time situation, you can um, things can good. Yeah, we did. Um... <laughs> One one of our mates in Brisbane, um, Wayne Judge, he's got a like a regular pool free diving um, like crew, and they train in in a swimming pool every week, and they they drill it all the time. And me, me and Turbo actually we met each other there, and uh, what it was a great it was a great place to meet. We we made we made our whole dive crew in that place, but the the rescue drills for me were like they were freaking phenomenal. I I was re- like when you do a free diving course, it only lasts two or three days. So, I mean, you do learn it, um, but you don't really keep practicing it after that. So I think 
Mm. I think that was really awesome. I really liked that. Yeah, and I, I yeah. liked it. Uh, uh, Wayne also flogs you a bit too. He gets you doing real hard <laughs> surface laps flat out and then um, and then pushes you into like a rescue, which is really good too because sure. you're knackered. You've got to go on that little dive. You've got to get them up the surface and you, you've, you've got to keep them there. Um, oh, it's, it's fantastic training. And I, I reckon I've seen uh, I've seen a couple of sambas now, and they're they're actually very confronting <clears throat> the first time you see them. So uh, yeah, I, I just I reckon like what the fourth time <laughs> you're a bit of a bit of an expert. Hey guys, if you're new to spear fishing, I highly recommend listening to our episode "Free Diving for Spear Fishing" with Pete Ryder. Pete uh, is an entrepreneur and an excellent freedive instructor, and he has come up with two great courses, the 10-meter freedive and the 5-minute freediver. I've used the 5-minute freediver to increase my bottom time. found it incredibly useful for my trip to the Coral Sea, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. His other course, the 10-meter freediver, is a great resource for those just starting out that literally want to get to 10 meters, and this course will help you learn proper breathing technique and some of the safety aspects associated with freediving. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 20% on all of Pete's courses. He's put together this deal just for listeners of the show. That's at howtofreedive.com. Use the code NoobSpiro. All right, next part of the show is Veterans Vault, where we take, or we ask our guests to take us deep into an area of their you know, their, their unique experience and expertise and, and you have got a lot of experience like from commercial diving and, 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 and cinematography really and putting together these amazing films that sort of showcase our beautiful oceans. Um, so we've teed up to chat with you a little bit about how you do that and, uh, and I mean, wh- where, did, where did your passion for making films come from? Um, it's probably just started like from all the adventures we used to do, like <clears throat> travelling the world and going to you know, beautiful places and um, I just wanted to kind of capture it for myself, I reckon. I was just like, oh, I'd love to, you know, capture this and document it myself to look back on it one day. And then I started, yeah, learning how to edit and I was like, oh, look, I can share it. Like I'll just make these little videos and share it and put some music on it. And then, yeah, I just sort of started there and then I, my experiences started to grow more. The more I traveled, the, the, the more I wanted to see and, and I just started yeah, going to the most amazing and magical places um, on the planet, really. And, yeah, I love to capture it on camera and capture the beauty of it. And then, again, just to start documenting it and, and sharing it with the world. And now we've, we've got a production company called Terra Australis, and it's got yeah some good following and people really enjoy it and really like to see it. And we've got some amazing content on there. And, yeah, a lot of people – have contacted us all like saying thanks so much and that's really got me inspired or it's maybe it's helped me appreciate the ocean and that's like our biggest goal ever I, I recently saw one of your vids it was in a sheltered kind of i don't know if it was a bay but it was like a little bit of sheltered water and it was just playing around with a seal yeah um, yeah <laughs> that's um i've so been i've been in perth and Fremantle working over the summer and yeah. Yeah, we've got a place called Rottnest Island just off just off the city there. So it's it's just beautiful. It's amazing. Like really lucky to have something like that right there. And yeah, there's some incredible spots out there on the islands. And there's a there's a seal colony as well. There's sea lions, and they're, they're probably the most interacting marine animal out there. Like I, I think that's where they started to get to know me. I was having my swim with them every weekend and. They were coming over and like they'll be sleeping on the beach and you would go up and you'll have a little swim around and they'll look up at you. They'll get that and they'll be that inquisitive. If you just swim around, jump around like you're having fun, they get they just come out and they just want to have fun as well. So they'll end up sw- swimming around you. They'll be kissing you here and there and <laughs> yeah, they're they're amazing. They'll you lay they'll land the bottom. You can lay next to them. You blah 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 blah. Like they yeah. you can tell they really enjoy hanging out, which is which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. All right. Like, um, whenever you learn something, I find you know you make a whole lot of mistakes. Um, and it's it's normally a great way to 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 show other people how to learn as well. What what are some of the mistakes you've made making um films? Like, did you did you do the classic um, you know, using cop you know infringing on artists you know music by putting you know famous tracks on your videos? 
Yeah, I've had that. That's not too bad. That, <laughs> the, big, the, the biggest thing is like just being ready because the ocean's that unpredictable. Like, oh, there's so many times where I've like jumped in my cards not in the camera and it says no SD card or whatever. <laughs> or I've had a flat ba- I've had, had a flat battery or double check your seals. Don't have any tiny tiny bit of hair or anything on your seal. You'll flood your camera. Just pretty much all that. Just being ready and for any type of action because. I guarantee it. When you're not ready, that's when that's when it comes through. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what do you, what do you use to shoot with predominantly? Uh, the last few years, I've been mainly using a a, um, a 5D Mark III in a Aquatica housing, mm-hmm. uh, which is an amazing camera. It takes the most beautiful photos. It does really good video as well. You got your 1080 HD stuff, but I've just upgraded to a GH5 Panasonic, just more revolved around the filming side of things because it does 4K 60 frames, um, which is which is really good for a, a small camera and it still has a high bit rate. It can still store a lot of the imagery and colours um, at, at a really deep depth, which is pretty um, techy for a, a small camera like that. So it's, I've just been aiming to get a camera that can almost be a base level for like, production stuff for like BBC because I've been, I've been talking to BBC lately. I've got a job coming up in the middle of April with them for like 21 days. So I'm pretty, pretty okay. excited, excited about that and pretty, feel pretty honored. But, um, I just want to make sure I have the, you know, the, the gear and the quality of camera to capture that sort of content that you may run into and can, can share it. And if you're lucky enough, you can share it on blue planet and then everyone definitely sees it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that a DSLR or is that a mirrorless? It's a mirrorless, a GH5. Okay. So, it's about it's in between the size of a um, of a of a mirrorless and a DSLR. It's a it's a, it's a medium sized camera. Um, I just got a Nord- Nordicam awesome. housing with it too, but it's a neat package. Ooh, that's yeah, an expensive nice. bit of kit. Um, what did that set you back with the housing? I just dropped about eight grand with the camera, the lens, the housing, the, everything, extra batteries, some SD cards. So eight eight grand it cost me. That's base base level. For wow. that big production stuff, some some people were in love with the Sony stuff. They p- apparently perform really well in low light. Turbo's got a, um, a S. What is it, Turbo? Oh, oh, I can't remember. Sony A five thousand or something. A, you got the A six thousand. You haven't got the expensive one. It's the A Mark II. Oh, is it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. I don't like it anyway. Oh, I feel much more comfortable <laughs> with a Canon seven D. I can tell you that much. This thing's all. Does its own thing and it's I don't know I just find that I just found I just found the the Canon thing I knew how to use it it was easy to operate and then Shrek recommended I get this camera it was the best thing in the world <laughs> I got it I can't stand the freaking thing to be honest yeah it's tricky eh yeah, going to did Canon are amazing cameras and they are set up really user friendly um, which yep. is good um, the 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 mirrorless cameras I don't know from what I'm looking at this one they've they pack a lot into a small thing, and there's now there's more technology, there's more buttons, there's more settings, so it's, it can take a lot to get your head around, eh? Yeah, well, this thing came with a manual that was like it was just freaking huge, <laughs> and like I was I was just pretty much just you know happy with the old turbo's, piece, like, oh. turbo's flat out reading the back of a packet of wheat bix let alone a, an instruction manual Mate, so thing, that was a that was a nightmare to <laughs> only thing i read is 99 tips to get better at spearfishing uh, that's all <laughs> i read <laughs> uh, no, i was just watching a tutorial on my gh5 the other day and i fell asleep with the camera in my hand eh? i was just like this is nuts I'm, i can't do it eh? i'm just gonna just figure it out as i go yep so Very cool so that that camera, though, are they a bit like the Sony as well, Andre? They're, like, really good in, in low light as well or, or like, not as, feeling They're good. not as good in low light. Like, the Sony, none of the Sonys would film 4K at 60 frames. There wasn't any other camera that filmed really 4K at 60 frames apart from the um, the Canon 1DX, which is a monster, which is the sickest camera, but it's twice the price as well. But I, I look at, like, not only just 4K at 60 frames, you're looking at, like, your bit rate and your, how much – how much megabytes it downloads a second as well? Because like you can, the GoPros do it as well, but they don't down, they don't capture the color grade that the other cameras can. And then you've got a heap of different post edit stuff that you can do with the um, with the imagery as well after that. So ah uh, okay all right. Well, and, let's talk about post edit. What what software are you using for for your editing your video? 
Uh, I use Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, I've been using that for years. I just do everything pretty basic, really, just have the nice content there, try and put something spectacular at the start just to capture the audience, don't have your segments running too long, um, puzzle a bit of a story together, and then have some beautiful music that can suit it and match it and and go f- and that's sort of the basics of it, eh? Like you don't really need a heap of techie stuff for editing. Um, it's all just cutting and pasting it together. You don't really need to flash it up too much. Otherwise, it gets a bit distracting, I think. But you can get – I do get a bit techie when if I start the color, color grade, if I want to color grade stuff. Okay. Uh, one, one thing I learned, like, from chatting with our media guy, Pat, and a few other people, I read a book on photography, was about thinking in shots. Um, is that something that you are really conscious of, like in terms of um, the length of the uh, of a shot or composition? Like, how do you how do you think about it? Depends. Like some some days we can have a shot list where we we'll go out and be like, this is what we need, this is what we want to create, this is a story that we're chasing. So we'll go out and be like, go to that spot, take this is what the imagery shots we need, bang bang bang. Okay, to this spot, bang, 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 we need this aerial shot to feel this and this, and we'll have a list, which is kind of good. But most of the time, I'm just winging it, really, and just going out, and if I see something that catches my eye, I'll, I'll capture it in a few different angles, maybe, and then and then I'll work on a story later on. I'll just have a, a heap of imagery where I can, yeah, make try and, try and make something out of it from there. Okay. okay. Yeah, you got to be. It seems like you got to be a little bit more sort of opportunistic with doing stuff in the water because you, you've got no control over what's coming your way, do you? Pretty much, hey. You just gotta either put your, put yourself in the right spot and and at the right time and see what happens. All right. And do you collaborate with editing, or do you just? Is it pretty much like? I mean, you've got a couple of guys in your film crew. Are you guys giving each other feedback? How much collaboration is involved in in, in putting together a, a, a film? Uh, yeah, no, there's massive collaboration for sure. Um, we've got the three of us in Terra Australis and Ryan's amazing. He's like really techie. He's wicked at editing. He's um he's got really good ideas and good, really great putting stories together. Um, Johnny's wicked at storytelling too. He's like he's you know he's got some really out of the out of the box ideas and he can yeah, really puzzle things together. So it's a really good team. I'm kind of lucky, I suppose. I'm always out in the field. I'm out capturing most of the content which is what i love to do the best and so we all where yeah, we do match together as a really good team john oh johnny is really good with the social media side of things so it takes a lot eh? like it's, it's, yeah it's a, cra- it's a crazy job actually if you want to be or oh, just get lots of interest you've got to keep pretty busy on it um and we all got our own jobs as well at the same time so this has kind of been a hobby but it's starting to form into a bit more it's turned into a business now We've done um, we've done our first doco with Discovery Channel not long ago, probably like six months ago. Um, we've still got other interests from different um, ventures as well, and we've got our own projects going on at the same time. <laughs> okay, wow. flat out. Eh? Have, have, have you guys got like any films for sale on like Vimeo on demand or something serious, something similar? No, we don't. Hey, at the moment, we're just everything's um, free online. Looking through our website got links to everything that we've been involved in with the um, Discovery Channel, the media side of things. We are, we are working on a story now that will probably be um, come out maybe as a movie eh? so, or um, another documentary, which may be a purchase thing online. But no, everything's, everything's free to air at the moment or free online. We've um we've followed David Ochoa along you know you know since we got onto his crowdfunding campaign ages ago. It was called Inhale the Azores in One Breath. Have you seen that film? I don't know why. It sounds familiar. Um, it, it, he ran it on um uh, Indiegogo, and Turbo and I got on and and we were stoked like um to sort of get onto a project like that. That was a long time ago. Recently, he's um released a documentary called Agua Negra. Um, and that's in Cape Verde, and uh, he's just sort of got a similar um, mindset to you about making it. So it's just interesting. I thought you might. I thought I'd you love might. to look it up. Hey, I'm a caveman most of the time. I don't really know um, much, much, uh, anything. But um, I'll definitely yeah, I'll, I'll grab a link and then check it out for sure. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, all right. Um, so we we were talking a little bit about. Um, some 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 failures at the start, and you were talking about equipment failures in particular. Do you have like a process now for preparing for the day's shooting? Like, um, do you have a checklist? I mean, what's your kind of your your prep for the day shoot look like? 
just just look at your gear really yeah just make sure yeah you know if you're shooting lines getting nicks with cuts in it you want to do that the night before that the morning you're really like if you've got any wear and tear on your shooting line that's that's a bad one you can always lose fish that way or if your flopper's not engaging properly or your rubbers have got a bit of sun damage and cracks just just replace just keep on it replace it store mm. your equipment right out of the sun sometimes you have a good have a spare pair of goggles is always good your straps can break yeah, make sure you don't forget your wetsuit. It can be cold sometimes. But um, another one, another big one is just where you're diving and what depth really and just having a, a, the proper weight for diving that depth. So if you're diving shallow, you're chasing crayfish, 5, 10 metres, whatever, you probably actually need a bit of weight to the extra weight. But if you start doing deeper stuff, chasing pelagics or deeper fish in 20, around 20 metres, 15, 20 metres, just make sure you take a weight off. Just don't, don't be heavy, eh, because that's where you get unstuck and – you'll notice the biggest difference too. Like It's okay to like use a little bit of extra energy to get down that first 10 metres or whatever and then, you, then you're neutrally buoyant and you'll sink to the bottom. But you'll notice a massive difference if, you, if you're heavy from the start and you sit on the bottom at 20 metres or 15 metres for a while chasing a fish and you turn to swim up and you're overweighted, it already sucks. Eh? You, yeah. know, you, know, <laughs> yeah. you know the biggest difference. Yeah, yeah. What about for your f- photography gear, like for a, for a shoot for – like what what does your preparation look like like for a day filming uh night before i'll prep my gear i'll clear all the cars i'll save everything off it make sure i've got enough memory space i'll charge all my batteries spare batteries whatever's needed if i've got a light that goes on my camera i'll have that fully charged i'll check over the housing make sure the water sensors um got a fresh it's got a charge battery um make sure the seals are right make sure the dome is clean clean it with um proper cleaning equipment so for like um aspiring filmmakers you know guys that are maybe on a gopro now and they maybe want to get a little bit more serious about making films have you got some sort of advice for them um in in terms of how to think just to keep doing what you're doing and whatever you love seeing you know like most people will love seeing it too so that's a good way to capture the content you want to share and just to be steady just keep a steady arm if you've got a gopro trunk grab one of those those units you can put it in like the handles because you can you know, if you've got a big bigger subject in your hands you can get the smoothest footage and just to move smooth and slow take your time um let things come to you um and just be yeah have, have it make sure your stuff's charged the night before because <laughs> I, I guarantee everyone's done it where you've something cool is happening and you go grab your gopro or your camera and it's flat <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah we had a we had a really great um bit of advice from tacker from um underwater ally he's he does a thumbs up before the end of every um video before he turns his video off yeah or a thumbs down or like a shaky hand do you do something similar not really eh? um that's a good idea though for sure um then you can go straight to the end of the clip and see whether or not it's um worthy or not but i kind of what another tip is to go through your stuff every night if really if you get if you're gonna be filming a lot just get home put it on your hard drive and look through it delete what it's not worthy and then keep keep what's good sometimes i'll put like a one at the end of it don't don't change the whole name of it because we'll put it all out of whack but leave the files all numbered but at the end of it put like a one or something if it's a good one and um then you'll remember or actually the best way to do it is to to write what was in it, like, oh, yeah, a whale swam over my head. Okay, guys, just like to welcome and announce our latest sponsor, Hex Aquatic. Now, Hex Aquatic, what is it? Well, basically, it's a Faraday shield in a wetsuit. And what does that mean? Well, it means it reduces your electronic signals underwater, helping you to remain undetected. Now, lots of our past guests are wearing this technology. Sebastian Kramer, Matt Madison, Travis Cork and Jager Crossingham, Chris Coates, David Ochoa, they're all wearing this suit. And why are they wearing it? They're wearing it to get closer to fish. It's the it's the latest in stealth technology for Spiros. Check them out at hexaquatic.com. All right, cool, let's move on. Uh, but what's, what's, what's one of the funniest things you've seen out spearfishing, Andre? One of the funnest, funniest, I'm pretty bad at this, eh? Like, I'm always setting my mates up. Like, I'm always, like, 
Oh, go in that cave, like, check, check out that crayfish and there'll be a big wobby gong, like massive wobby gong sitting there or something. And I'll go grab it by the tail as he puts his head in there or something like that. But one sick one that was really funny, it was it, it smashed me as well, but I've been done by one before. It was at Numray, the electric stingrays. And the okay. first time I got first time I got dusted by one of them. They're normally sit in the sand, like in a little shallow cave, like pretty much where crayfish is. So first one I got dropped by one, I was like had my arm in this cave. And I was trying to get this crayfish and this electric bolt went straight on my arm, straight in my chest. I thought I was having a heart attack, like I'm folding <laughs> up. I was like freaking out. I was like, I'm having a heart attack. Like my whole chest was kind of hurt. And it was a massive shock, like way stronger than an electric fence. Yeah. And I was like, took my, I, was, I had to take some deep breaths and seeing if I was going to die or not. And I was realized I was like, all right. And then I went back down and it's like, what, what was that? And I went in and I seen this weird ray thing and I was like, what that is crook has and then anyway that <laughs> night I went and start researched it and there's a num ray and they're they're sick fish actually and then six stingray they got they're like a funny stingray shape but they have an extra little bobby tail thing on the end of them and they always hide below the sand and then electric shock their prey and eat them. Hmm. Anyway <laughs> so I've been dusted by one already and anyway months and a year later, I don't know how long later, I'm out diving with Travi and Simon Ladder, another good mate and we were diving, chasing crazy, found these crazy. Anyway, I got my arm in this hole and bang, I get smacked again. I was like, oh, <laughs> I ripped my arm out a bit. But then I was like, all right. And I, I didn't want to like show the boys that. I, I was like, straight away, I was like, I'm going to get one of these boys. Eh? And I ripped my arm out. And he's like, they're like, what happened? And I was like, oh, I just like kind of cut it wedged. It's the biggest crayfish. And I knew someone was like, I'm going to get it. And he went down and I was just started losing it. And Travi <laughs> knew, Trav knows me too well. He's like, what is, what is in there? And I was like, watch this shit. <laughs> anyway, he went in there. <laughs> he got so bolted. He came flying to the surface, screaming, going, what is it? And we couldn't even talk. They were all laughing and crying. <laughs> what is it? He was panicking. Eh? He's like, thought he was going to die. <laughs> oh, God, this is the best trick I've ever done, I reckon. Eh? It was so good, so gold. I couldn't talk, couldn't even talk. Eh? It was just, I was just, he was so panicky. He just like, wanted to know what it was. Yeah. Like, he thought he was about the same as I did when I first got hit. He thought he was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> you are now joining the, the classic list of Noob Spiro pranksters. We've had some crackers on the show. That was a, That's a really good one. I like that. It was so good. <laughs> oh, good, man. Um, look, what's in your dive bag? You're over there in WA Xmouth now. What's, um, what are you kind of wearing head to toe? Um, I've been running the Hex wetsuits for ages now. Um, well, this gave me a suit to test out like two years ago, I think. Okay. And, you know, I've seen this new suit and this technology in it, and I was like, what is this? It's kind of weird, but, I'll, you know, I'll give it a go because we're always playing with sharks and testing things out and, Anyway, the first time I wore it was off this island off up this way, and I jumped in. I was like, "It's pretty, they're pretty sick suits. They're really comfy and really warm." And I jumped in, and yeah, like it was nuts. I was like patting turtles, and had I was running my hands down sharks, and I was like, "No, nah, this is just a coincidence." But uh, ever since, eh, I've always had some amazing experiences, eh, with all different types of sharks, like big tiger sharks, bumping my, pushing their nose on my camera, and. I'm um, always getting fish coming up nice and close. I've had like these whales and just everything, killer whales. And don't know, I, I'm pretty calm as well. Like my mates, like I'm always pretty trying to pretty keep pretty uh, low heart rate anyway. But yeah, these suits are sick. But that's all I wear now. Like was just looked after us too. And yeah, they're they're epic suit. They're really good make and the technology in it's really interesting. So it's something for people to check out. It's a happy coincidence, Andre, because um, Hex have just jumped on and they've started supporting the Noob Spirit podcast. So yeah, we've had a good chat with Warren recently, mm. and uh, he's a mad dude. We're we're really uh, we're really enjoying following the Hex journey. Uh, it's great to see some new tech around. For sure, no, he's a, he's a really good guy as well. So it's. It's nice to know like where your product comes from and how it's, you know. Down. He runs the whole. Th- he runs it all, but he still does lots himself. He communicates with everyone. He, you know, you really looked after, so that's really cool. But that's just mm. that's the wetsuits I wear now. Um, cool. So they 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 last me. They do really well for me. Awesome. So are you are you using one of the custom ones, like with the Yamamoto Forty Five, or are you using the what 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 hex suit are you using? I'm not sure. Eh? It's just. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 thickness is it? Oh, I've got a five mil and a three mil. Oh, spoil! I just mix it up because I get, get cold easy. Eh? I haven't got much meat in my bones. <laughs> oh, you got kindred spirit here. Turbo turbo gets cold very easy too. 
Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, not enough meat in the bones, but um, because I've done a few projects down south with Great Whites, and that's where like oh, I've got the soup is freezing down there. So he's hooked me up with a five meal, I've done stuff in Neptune Islands and Salisbury Island in Australia, and um, it's yeah, in chilly, eh? Mm, cool, cool. All right, what about what about guns and fins and masks and stuff? For sure, I've got the Octo masks. Um, those guys have given us a few of those and it's kind of like one of the only masks it's like a beard and that and a mustache so it's like one of the only masks that kind of seal with my mo but um okay. so I always been just comfortable with it like it's a, it's a pretty big eye one but it's got a, a gopro attachment it seals my face really well so i roll with that i've just got a normal snorkel this a, a like a full through one or whatever without the valve and that on it so yeah yep. really like that i just run the snorkel under my mask strap with it just holds really tight so when you it doesn't flap around which is cool um oh, cool. and then just yeah the hex food the gloves and the socks and then the weight belt's just one of the, the rubber ones or whatever so you can kind of get it tight around you so when you do diving down the wetsuit compressors doesn't slip around on you yeah do you do you run a string like underneath like it like a g-banger to um to stop it from moving at all no nah. oh some guys like clip they 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 clip like I know they they don't move much the rubber weight belts, but they'll clip like um, on the front and then it goes between your legs up through your bum cheek and clips on the back of your belt, and that way it doesn't move at all. No, that sounds sounds very European. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the only thing they wear, or they wear suits? <laughs> No, nah, like I've seen, I've got a couple of mates that do it, and Chris Coates does it as well. I've just, I've seen a few dudes do it, but not everyone does it. So I was just, I was just interested. So yeah, no, it'd probably be all right though. But I don't, I'm, it seems to sit pretty snug, eh? So if I had more movement, I reckon I'd look at something like that for sure. I run a, I run a slim knife on, the, on my hip as well on my weight belt. So it's just, it's like a, a, it's like a fabric kind of pouch with the knife that slides, a flat knife that slides inside it. So it's pretty streamlined. Um, you're never really going to forget your knife. It's always on your weight belt too, which is good. Has your hex suit got the external pocket? Yeah, I think it does. Eh? I know the other ones do. It's got another, it's got another one today. But um, yeah, they all do. Eh? They're pretty good for a torch. But yeah. I don't know. I'm, I don't know about a knife. Put a knife in there. It's got the right size and fits good, eh? Tur- Turbo plays cricket, so he's always got a bit of sandpaper in his. So. Ooh, dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've run this one. joke twice now, but... <laughs> we've, we've, we've all got a bit of sandpaper floating around. It's dodgy, yeah. guys, yeah. <laughs> now, it's, um, with my fins and down in my fins, I've just got um some special. They're called special fins. They're a carbon blade. Um, okay. I've had them for years, eh? Dan... Dan at, um, from Rabbi Tech in Kosaba used to look after me with a lot of gear, eh? And he, those fins are off the hook, eh? They're really, I don't know, they're pretty robust, really strong. They're cool. good flex. Um, they were in a soft, you were like a, a soft stiffness? I've got um, soft, yeah. Yeah. All right. What foot pockets? I've got the Stingrays, Mares Stingrays. Oh, Oma, Oma Stingrays. Oma Stingrays. Yeah, I had them before. I switched to the Marius, but I, I think they're both kind of much of a muchness. Um, but yeah, I liked them. Yeah, it's um, and that's about it, really. Yeah, all my guns, like yeah, I've been just using other guns, eh? Because I haven't even been spearing that much. Like my mates are on the spearing, and if they can't really shoot a fish, and they'll be like, "All right, give me a gun then." And then <laughs> that was the last time, I had, last gun I had, I was spearing chasing Mackies, and I was laying on the bottom. It was about probably seventeen meters, and then like. This Mackie, maybe 18, 20 kilo, came in. I shot it, a good shot. Kind of stoned it, and I was like, oh, sweet. So I just went to, like, pull the gun towards me and, like, go up the shooting line towards fish, and then it did a bolt, and then it was wrapped around the rubber. And it, because I was sort of, like, I was, like, moving up towards the shooting line. I didn't have really a grip on my gun, so it, like, ripped out of my hands, and then um, it just quivered off into, like, the, the, the gloom. It was, like, late arvo island so it just disappeared and then i haven't really bought a gun since then because eh? i've always used it, mates because there's always someone that's got a gun i just take the camera <laughs> cool. cool but i've got i've just come up to x and i've got a heap of hand-built guns that i made when i was younger so i might spruce them up a bit and dust off the broom dust them off <laughs> yeah dust the broom off <laughs> cool man oh that sounds like a good bunch of kit um we heard about your camera as well um what about when you're traveling do you use what do you use a like a sports tube or anything um traveling's tricky yeah it's, it's so much equipment it's nuts um 
I've got a Pelican case where I try and fit a lot of valuables in it, um, like my housing and stuff and the camera equipment. Um, there's my free diving gear. Yeah, I'll use like a in my wetsuit stuff. I have like a dry bag. I can fit most of the stuff that can potentially be wet. I'll try and jam it into that, and then it will go into a backpack on my back. But and then over the time, over the years, yeah, we've had like you know gun bags, and then you can put your wetsuit in around your guns and stuff, and lay your fins in there and everything like that. Like yeah, you can. Those gun bags can be pretty good for traveling too, but. Man, your equipment gets heavy. Like you start traveling. So I've been most of the time I'm traveling around. If I'm doing that sort of stuff, I've got at least 40 to 50 kilos worth of equipment because I like surfing and I like spearfishing and I like filming. So like so mm. much gear. Right? <laughs> yeah, nah, cool. All right, did you have any more equipment questions, Turbo? Um, no, nah, not really. I I was, was kind of um, happy with all the blue water um, gear. More so, I was, I was, that was bloody yeah. interesting. But um, yeah, it was a good chat. Yeah. Last part of the show. Uh, are you ready to go, Andre? It's a fast-paced round of questions. Oh, mate, let me oh, ask yeah. one of these. These are fantastic. This is Spiro Q and A. Just, just shoot from the hip, buddy. Um, could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? Peaceful and nice and rewarding. At the end of the day. There you okay, go, pretty eh? good, pretty good. <laughs> um, I'm always trying to get a good philosophical answer from this. Tebo hates it, but uh, that was all right. I liked it. Tell me um, you wanted to go. Yeah, mate. Let, let, uh, okay. Um, if you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? Not much, eh? I reckon it's been an amazing journey. I'm pretty stoked. All right. Who is the, the best person to go spearfishing with and why? Uh, Travis would be my favorite because we could trust each other with our lives and we just always seem to have a pretty amazing time. Oh, this is awkward. He chose Simon. <laughs> oh. Just joking, mate. Tears in my eyes, eh? Hey? Just, Just joking. joking. Can I change my answer? Stitch up. What is the best spearfishing? If you could only choose one place to go spearfishing, where would you go? West Coast is pretty beautiful, eh? it's amazing, it's pretty prolific, full of fish. Who has been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing? Um, all those old boys, eh? like Torelli and Buckridge and Pickering and all those boys. Eh? It was pretty cool to watch all the movies they used to do in the old school times. How good was it? How good was an old school VHS just getting getting a flogging? Had a good day. It was crazy, yeah. <laughs> it was had the wickedest music and that, all this old school music and shaky Footage, it's cool. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. But it'll be mangles, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. All right. Um, what What's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? Uh, it's just to like, look after each other, really. And one up, one down is my favorite word. Well, let's do, let's do one last one and then we'll call it a day. Um, if you could go back in time to when you were starting and give yourself some advice, what would you say? Um, just to take your time and be relaxed, and when you're hunting fish, maybe or something like that. Want to be get out, get out of this spot. It's mine. That'd be mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, man, we've had a cracker chat. This is fast becoming one of my fa- favorite interviews of all time. Um, Boys, well, it's been hell. It's been nice talking yeah. to you guys too. Eh? I'd love to send people to come and check out your social media and all the rest of it. Where can people come and find you, Andre? Um, so we've got, yeah, Instagram, Facebook, and a website, Terra Australis. So you just Google it. The website is terraustralis.tv. I've got my own Instagram stuff too, Andre Rukur Creative, where it's my own kind of story stuff and uh, what, I, what I like to do and share. And a website as well, andrerukurcreative.com. Awesome. I'm going to link all that up in your show notes. Um, Terra Australis, T-E-R-R-A? T E double R A, yep. Australis A A U S T R A L I S. That's the one, mate. All right, choice, choice. Cool, man. We've had a fantastic mm. chat. I've learned a, a, a ton, and uh, I think we could have another interview uh, easily. Thanks for having us, eh? Yeah, no, awesome, mate. Um, particularly loved your dog tooth tuna breakdown. There was a few tips there. Um, that we haven't heard before that are definitely probably fish savers that it probably um, will make guys choose differently when they're buying gear, which is 
it seems to be a huge thing with equipment failure with that sort of stuff. So definitely learned something, mate. It was excellent. And I actually, I kind of uh, sympathise with you there a little bit in how you're transitioning from, you know, wanting to shoot huge fishing at that rush to sort of um, filming and, and taking a, 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 a just a feed home. I think that's sort of yeah, sort, sure. sort of like something I can definitely relate to. Yeah, awesome, mate. No, it is. It's a good transition, and um, and then it just makes you appreciate everything else that's happening in the ocean instead of just focused on getting fish. And some guys can be bums; they didn't get a fish, but meantime they've had dolphins and sharks and amazing bait balls and you know clownfish swimming around below them, but they're a bit blind blinded by the getting fish so and let's not forget electric rays that just make you, <laughs> make you poo your pants um oh well. i can't wait for <laughs> one of you boys to run into one of them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all good all good andre well we will catch you again at some stage in the future sounds good guys thanks heaps eh? wow what an absolutely crack a chat with Andre today I had an absolute ball and I know Turbo did too did you guys enjoy it what did you think uh, come along to noobspirit.com find the Andre uh, page and put something in the comments let us know what you thought because I had an absolute ball the uh, the blackout stories alone were phenomenal and very encouraging to um, make me think about um, going and doing a refresher in terms of my um, my rescue training and uh, the, the dog tooth tuna equipment I'll be going back and listening to this episode a few times. What, an, what, a, what a cool dude. And uh, look, our Kickstarter project, as I mentioned at the start of the episode, is in its last days. So go over to kickstarter.com and get yourself a copy of 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. It is fully illustrated with photography from some of the best in the world. And uh, we're just absolutely stoked with the support our community's um, shown for this. And uh, big thanks to the influencers that have um, shared this project around and and helped us um, helped us get it off the ground, really. And if you do get it yourself, if you pledge for a copy of the soft cover or better, you will get a free copy of Spiro Log. So get on to that. Uh, last little last little bit. Um, jump on Instagram and follow Spear Junkies. These guys are shooting a twelve part TV series, and it's uh, Chris Coates, Chris Dillon, MJK, and Brett Harvey. And uh, it looks really interesting and uh, looking forward to hearing more from the boys about that as this kind of uh, adventure progresses. So follow them, Spear Junkies. Um, last but not least, next week we're off to Club Spearfish in Melbourne to talk to Sven Franklin, who's a long-time listener of the show. And uh, he's a great guy. We learn a lot about the Melbourne conditions and a little bit about Club Spearfish, which is a popular spearfishing club there in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, it's an absolute cracker chat. So we will join. hope you'll join us then in a fortnight. All right, for, fortnight. That's by in two weeks for Americans that don't know what fortnight is. Okay, guys, peace. Catch up. Sometimes... It's time to spend some money on yourself. And there's nothing like a new spear gun. That's right. Head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a big range of spear guns. Get tempted and read the customer reviews and really sort of have a look at what they've got to offer. Turbo and I love the Manny Sub roller guns. You can buy them at spearfishing.com.au. Go in and check out the spear guns. If you do decide to buy something, pump in the code new spear at checkout and save $20 on every purchase over $200. If you do have problems, they have a hassle-free returns policy, cheap shipping rate worldwide, and a price beat guarantee for Australia. You can also check out the stores in Brisbane, Sydney, or Melbourne, and get help from more than 40 underwater experts. Online, they also have live help. You can talk to people online and ask any questions you might have about products. So head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a huge range of spear guns.